All right, so um, search of premises, search for a method on the idea that investigations into the conditions for freedom should be leveled in between Marxism and existentialism. He retains as a framework, framework Marx's dialectical materialism, which dissolves traditional subject-object dichotomies to show how the two spheres impinge upon one another simultaneously and reciprocally, but at the same time he prioritizes the role of individual projects. Contemporary Marxism, Sartre argues, rests on a distortion of these basic precepts. Here, human activity is robbed of its full significance, as it is subsumed under a schema composed of only static universals. Sartre's critique of contemporary Marxism aligns with Marx's description of fetishism, which indicates the treatment of material conditions and commodities as signified by determinations that are forgotten to have lied in the grip of human hands. What Sartre conceives as a potentially compelling account of freedom under the original Marxist framework is abandoned to an account centered on an objective and autonomous force. Sartre argues that this misunderstanding can be corrected by illuminating the implicit function of existential analyses in Marx's original writings. If we guide his own earlier work into compatibility with dialectical materialism, he contends, then we are led to a fuller understanding of the role of human activity in Marx's totality. Particularly, this is best clarified by adopting what Sartre calls the regressive-progressive model, which explicates an individual-specific situation and the ability she she retains to go beyond it through her creative projects. With this method, he claims, we are able to save a a potent Marxist account of freedom. While I find Sartre's critique of contemporary Marx unpersuasive, I challenge the plausibility of his alternative account. It is true that individual activity keeps the dialectical process in motion, but Sartre wrongly equates this activity with his sense of freedom. Sartre is only able to make this claim because he undermines Marx's emphasis on the framing of imminent perception by material conditions. Individuals are not always or fully able to surpass their situations in the way that Sartre describes because material conditions do not impact individuals only by framing their economic situations. Rather, they bleed into the social, cultural, and political spheres And what's more, these effects largely go undetected by individual consciousness as they are impressed on a sensible level. Although individuals may perceive themselves as thinking and acting freely in Sartre's sense as they react to and transcend material conditions, this perception would be at odds with Marx's description of reality. As for him, even the pre-reflexive ways in which individuals comport themselves are heavily limited by the conditions of capitalist society. Because Sartre overlooks this, I argue that he subverts the central role that Marx's description of fetishism plays in the dialectical framework. For Marx, the defect of most philosophies is that they conceive reality, quote, only in the form of the object or of contemplation, but not as sensuous human activity, practice, not subjectively, unquote. Sartre claims that contemporary Marxists likewise fail to understand the significance of human activity in Marx's totality. The abstract laws of a given epoch, which Marx conceives as developing dialectically, are here treated as ahistorical, unchanging directives. As Sartre puts it, quote, it is always the materialism which is presented as the independent variable, which never undergoes any modification, unquote. As Marx's concern lies specifically with material conditions of capitalist society, Sartre deals his, his criticism of contemporary Marxism to focus on its treatment of the commodity. Sartre argues that contemporary Marxists treat the commodity, quote, as more real than buyers and sellers. It is here where he explicitly accuses them of fetishism. In Capital, Marx describes fetishism as the understanding of commodities as material objects whose ontological connection with social relations has been neglected. Commodities are instead regarded as the inevitable outcomes of universal natural laws. The specific social dynamics that constitute the production of commodities are, for both worker and capitalist, substituted by, quote, the fantastic form of relation between things. The fetishizing of commodities yields a fetishizing of the economic market in general. This is what Sartre has in mind when he claims that, for contemporary Marxist, quote, the abstract relations of things with each other, of merchandise and money, etc., mask and condition the direct relations of men with one another. However, whereas Marx's understanding of fetishism intends to provide a description of the way in which individuals in general comport themselves within the capitalist framework, Sartre restricts his understanding of fetishism to correspond only to his criticism of contemporary Marxists. I will expand on this discrepancy in the final section. I will first explain the descriptive method he endorses to repair this inadequacy.
contemporary Marxism, Sartre claims, quote, has entirely lost the meaning of what it is to be a man. Here, he draws attention to what he conceives of the only inherent property of the human condition, namely freedom. Sartre reconstructs Marxism so that its apparent focus on the individual comes to light. To do this, he modifies his earlier ideas and being a nothingness to fit within Marx's framework. The result, he claims, quote, and tends, without being unfaithful to Marx's principles, to find mediations which allow the individual concrete, the particular person, to emerge from the background of the general contradictions of productive forces and relations of, relations of production, unquote. This initial description differs from Sartre's earlier work insofar as the latter's division between the for itself and in itself is trans transformed into a division between praxis and the practico inert. In being in nothingness, Sartre posits a comparatively rough ontological boundary between human consciousness on the one hand and material situations on the other. The in itself functions as a static background of social, political, cultural, and economic context issued for a given individual life and for itself functions just as consciousness, an individual's innate ability to make spontaneous and meaningful choices that objectify herself beyond this background. This division is more distinct than that between praxis and the practical inert because it is less explicit about the significance of human activity for the establishment and maintenance of the for itself, of, of the in itself, excuse me. The division between praxis and the practical inert, Sartre argues, corrects this by redefining the for itself and in itself in such a way that the two operate inextricably on a single ontological plane. More precisely, consciousness, which Sartre now takes as praxis, is limited by the kinds of, back kinds of background conditions noted above. And these conditions, what he now takes as the practical inert, are necessarily impacted by praxis's historical trajectory. We can think of this relationship as nearly identical to Marx's description of dialectical progression. Like Marx, Sartre wishes to bridge the gap between subjectivity and objectivity so that he can arrive at an understanding of reality as the product of an ongoing historical process driven by syntheses of conceptual and material transformations. Although individuals are bound by material conditions, it is they who have driven the history of their production. This portion of Sartre's argument re remains faithful to Marx's framework. The implicit idea that he claims to pull out of Marx's framework, however, may serve as a point of contention. Namely, he argues that by highlighting the role of the individual in dialectical materialism, we are immediately able to, quote, restore to the indiv individual man his power to go beyond his situation by means of work and action, unquote. Although the individual is, quote, unquote, the product of his own products, he is also, quote, a historical agent who can under no circumstances be taken as a product, unquote. It is precisely this lack of focus that, for Sartre, leads contemporary Marxism into confusion. Or if, we, if we are to understand Marx's totality adequately, then we must adhere to what he calls the re regressive progressive method, which will elucidate the specific situations, choices, and possibilities that help to compose individual projects. The regressive portion of Sartre's method undertakes to analyze an individual's particular history as it is conditioned by the universal structures of her epoch. It is an understanding, one, the material conditions issued to a particular individual, and two, the projects that the individual realizes throughout her personal history that we are able to apprehend the dialectical thread that ultimately frames her possible projects. This is not to say with contemporary Marxists, however, that these projects are determined by this thread. On the contrary, for Sartre, the individual retains the essential capacity to transcend her situation through free agency. This dynamic composes the progressive portion of Sartre's method. He focuses specifically on the capacity of individuals to pose antagonisms to their epoch's particular mode of production and subsequent class structure. In contrast to contemporary Marxists, he argues that the dynamics of these antagonisms, quote unquote, cannot be reduced to concepts, as they depend on the particular individual's perception of her struggles within her given situation, which go unnoticed by analytic analyses. Although such struggles reveal the common economic character of society, the individual, quote, cannot avoid particularizing the latter by projecting himself through it toward, uh, toward his own objectification, unquote. Just as a child comes this or that because he lives the universal as the particular, that is, creates his history by living through the practical and nervous praxis, the adult individual, too, conditioned by these previous syntheses between universality and particularity, comes to respond to his present situation via passions, works, and acts, and thereby surpasses these material conditions in a way that creates new possibilities, both for him, himself and, ideally, the social class that he represents. With this understanding, 
Sartre is purportedly able to remain within Marx's dialectical framework while positing into the latter an existential analysis of the individual. While Sartre maintains Marx's overall framework, I suggest that his conception of freedom undermines Marx's description of the role of fetishism in everyday life. I note uh, Marx's description of fetishism earlier, and what I try to intimate here is the way in which it departs from Sartre's reference to fetishism, because Sartre introduces the notion only to criticize contemporary Marxism. Although I don't disagree that much of contemporary Marxism is committed to fetishism, I claim that Sartre fails to articulate that for Marx, the fetishistic attitude is a phenomenologically accurate description of everyday thought and reality within capitalist society. If Sartre is to remain fully faithful to Marxism while espousing an account of freedom, then he must explicitly examine the ways in which we pre-predicatively regard objects and events as devoid of human activity. However, Sartre jumps to uphold his understanding of freedom as an innate human capacity to transcend pre-existing material conditions. Although he admits that material conditions set the framework for individual possibilities, it is finally the individual who freely chooses to react against her situation, that is, to comport herself in a way that stretches beyond the latter's confines. He undermines, I argue, the role of the capitalist mode of production on on the choices actualized by what he conceives as freedom. Again, he claims that within the Marxist framework, the cultural order, the acts, passions, and works that compose individual freedom are irreducible to the natural order, the economic character of the mode of production. This statement culminates Sartre's reaffirmation of the very subject-object dichotomy that he intends to dispel. Although Sartre describes choices as framed by material conditions, which he does maintain arise from dialectical processes between human activity and material conditions, he does not adequately adequately account for the dialectical relationship between these conditions and the individual's present and future choices, and I'll explain. So rather, Sartre not only continues to separate ontologically this first sphere from the second, but also inverts the traditional traditional dichotomy so so that the subjective sphere is given primacy. Marx frequently indicates that the sort of, uh, sort of freedom possible in capitalist society is only a formal one. In everyday circumstances, Sartre's conception of freedom would be for Marx a false appearance stemming from commodity culture, the ideology. Although the worker is seemingly free by her own will to engage in commerce with capitalists, it is of course the commodity form that compels her into commerce by restricting alternative avenues for reliably attaining an adequate means of subsistence. Marx writes, quote, but when the transaction was concluded, it was discovered that the worker was no free agent, that the period of time for which he is free to sell his labor power is the period of time for which he is forced to sell it, that in fact the vampire will not let go while there remains a single muscle, sinew, or drop of blood to be exploited, unquote. Trapped within the capitalist mode of production, the worker is unable to survive unless she sells herself as a free slave to the production of commodities. Sartre would respond that, although the worker is forced into commerce, she is able to distance herself from this material framework by objectifying herself meaningfully via praxis. However, I push Sartre on this by drawing attention to Marx's uh, remarks on the stronghold of capitalist production on the worker's both body and mind. Capitalist production in its mature state is necessarily accompanied by the arising of machinery, which, with its distilling and manipulation of the worker, quote, confiscates every atom of freedom, both in bodily and in intellectual activity, unquote. Workers become the living appendages of of machinery, as through the enforcement of the barrack-like discipline, he says, directing their handling the latter. They are forced to suppress any semblance of spontaneous thought and activity. The worker's independence is crippled by the machinery that continually engineers her bodily movements and quells her liberty to produce under the jurisdiction jurisdiction of her own creative and organizational authority. This leads to the subduing of the worker's passionate energy, which for Sartre otherwise enables individuals to preserve their individuality within the situation and potentially assume an antagonistic position against it. My standpoint, Marx writes, from which the development of the economic formation of society is viewed as a process of natural history, can less than any other make the individual responsible for relations whose creature he remains, socially speaking, however much he, um, however much he may subjectively raise himself above them, unquote. 
Although the worker carries the dialectical process forward by objecting his or her labor within the capitalist mode of production, this activity does not adhere to Sartre's understanding of freedom. While Sartre emphasizes the role of the pure subject in the dialectical process, Marx emphasizes the role of the object, the material conditions of capitalist society, in the formation of the subject. Yet still, Sartre would object that here we are only dealing with the situation as the, of the worker as he or she comports him or herself within the industrial sphere, and, and hence not within the complete situation that he or she enjoys as an innately free agent with all of his or her indwelling passions, works, and actions that manifest, uh, manifest both in and outside of the workplace. This objection, however, would overlook Marx's description of the capitalist mode of production as a situation that not only subsumes the, subsumes the agency of the worker, but dictates, dictates completely the way in which individuals comport themselves pre-productively pre towards the world. Marx heavily emphasizes the, emphasizes the determination of sens sensuous perception by the commodity form. For instance, in uh, the German ideology in his criticism of Feuerbach, he writes, quote, so much is this activity this unceasing sensuous labor and creation, this production, the basis of the whole sensuous world as it now exists, that were it interrupted for only a year, Feuerbach would not only find an enormous change in the natural world, but would very soon that the whole world of men and his perceptive faculty, nay, his own existence, were missing." Unquote. The activity that Marx refers to here is just the mode of production specific to capitalist society. The latter bleeds out of uh, from what Sartre would find as the natural order onto what he would define as the cultural order. The very way in which individuals perceive their situations and thus the conscious actions that they may perform in reaction to them are conditioned by the framework of the commodity form that overreaches not only the economic, but also the social, political, and cultural context of capitalist society. Or to be more precise, for Marx, it is this first form that shapes the form of all aspects of society as economic character defines at each particular epoch, it de defines all of the concepts, perceptions, actions, and identities possible within it. Even if one may, may be aware of one's exploitation as a worker and consciously react against one's situation in the form of protest or unionized labor, one will still pre-consciously perceive most phenomena as manifestations, manifesta manifestations sorry, of the commodity form. This is suddenly motivated to take one example by contemporary media, whose ties to capitalist interests are increasingly inextricable. Although I don't have the space here to examine Judith Butler's Foucauldian analysis of contemporary me media with the attention it deserves, I think it potentially can introduce pertinent conversation points on the shortcomings of Sartre's analysis. What Butler calls media framing points to an arrangement of reality by the relational powers of the public sphere that serve to defend capitalist agendas. Through rhetoric and images, the political media complex masks such agendas by framing them, away, framing them in a way that incites in its audiences an emotional and bodily response that cannot be easily detected. Framing works fundamentally through the senses, repelling certain responses and encouraging others before they can be reflected on consciously. Most significantly, contemporary media helps to impress upon viewers the perception that certain objects, ideas, events, and social groups enjoy an, an essential objective status. To illustrate this, Butler focus up, focuses on the media's implicit uh, dehumanization of minority groups in Western, and I, I particularly mean here American society, um, such as the representation of black men as inherently violent. Narratives focused on purported violence enacted by black men are re rerun continually in American media images and rhetoric, visually and orally indoctrinating its audiences to eminently perceive them as persons to be dehumanized and feared. The depth of the media's indoctrination is evident in the fact that even self-critical citizens who do not perceive themselves as racist may continue to become immediately fearful in situations where they share their space with black men. Such perceptions are enforced by the sensible stronghold of political media complex propaganda. The point I want to make here is that although we may perceive ourselves as objectifying ourselves beyond the situation issued by the commodity form, the latter pervades society in a way that we must doubt the self-determination of these perceptions. Um, not reject them, but at least doubt. <laughs> uh, in many instances, while an individual may choose to become active in an anti-racist movement, he or she may continue, and I would say certainly probably does, uh, to carry on racist perceptions 
lately encouraged by, again, for instance, contemporary American media. Even if an individual perceives herself as acting through creative, spontaneous praxis, this perception will be partially misguided, for to a certain extent, both her praxis and perception of it will be determined by conditioning that occurs on a preconscious and sensible level. This leads me to suggest that Sartre fails to acknowledge the fetishistic attitude as a phenomenologically accurate description of individual thought and behavior in capitalist society. I've used media framing only as an example as that I think it provides a contemporary edge to Marx's notes on the inclusive, inclusiveness of commodification and fetishism. Although Sartre claims that the cultural realm, praxis, is irreducible to the natural realm, an epoch's particular economic character, and thus that the former can, on the everyday level, recognize and oppose the latter through free individual projects, it is clear that the cultural, too, is ineluctably tied to the natural. An epoch's uh, economic character determines thought and activity in a, w in a way more significant than Sartre admits. While individuals certainly react against their situations via passions, works, and acts, the way in which they perceive these reactions will be deeply conditioned by the specific modes of pre-predicative sensible indoctrination that the commodity form engenders. Uh, although Sartre may point out, and indeed I have as well, that Marx mostly restricts his explicit description of fetishism to the realm of industry, it is clear that both for Marx and many contemporary critics, the essence of the industrial paradigm has and is expanding exponential, exponentially to the societal, cultural, and political sectors that lie outside of the physical workplace. I claim then first that Sartre ultimately misinterprets the cultural order to be composed entirely of pure human praxis, and second, because of this, that he overlooks the significance of Marx's specific description of fetishism, which finally aims to emphasize the stronghold of material conditions on imminent perce perception. To conclude, with this said, we must not overlook Marx's contention that praxis, which we can think of in Sartre's sense, in Sartre's sense can significantly overturn predominant paradigms. After all, one of his central aims is to expound the possibility for the proletariat to become, become collect collectively aware of exploitation, and rise against it so significantly that the economic character of capitalist society is turned over. However, I do not think that Marx envisions such a conversion as taking place on the level of Sartre's analysis, which furnishes each individual with the everyday possibility of enacting this significant change. Freedom, in Sartre's sense, for Marx, would be reserved for limited circumstances in which individuals have reached a certain dialectical stage when the capitalist mode of production, widespread collective antagonism, and an emergent socialist framework diverge to make uh, revolutionary change possible. Hence, the individual would need to be uh, need to begin to be emancipated not only from the confines of capitalist industry that currently serve as the only avenue for basic subsistence, but from specific conceptual indoctrinations delivered through sensible measures that limit the perceptions of possibilities of individuals as not only workers but general citizens of capitalist society. Thank you.